Why is smell often called the Cinderella sense? And it's so underrated in our culture, especially when many luxury products such as wine, spirits, perfumes are based on it. How could smell tests be used to detect certain diseases, perhaps even 10 to 15 years before the usual diagnosis? And even though dogs have a more acute sense of smell uh, than humans do, more than twice the number of scent receptors than humans, um, why are we better at smelling wine aromas? Well, tonight you're going to get those tips and stories with our guest, whom I'll introduce momentarily. If you're watching this video on the replay, please get into the comments and type the word replay or the city where you're watching from. And of course, if you're here on the live stream, I want to hear from you as well. I'm Natalie McLean. I offer popular online food and wine pairing courses, and you've just uh, joined one of the most passionate groups of wine lovers who gather every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern to talk to the most interesting people in the worlds of wine and beyond. Now, I I am live streaming this for the first time on YouTube and Facebook, um, but it is based on a recorded conversation that I had with our guest for my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk. That said, I'm here live with you in the comments, so get in there, let me know what stories and tips you're enjoying, what questions we haven't answered yet, and I'll be responding, as they say, in real time uh, as we watch the video. All right, back to our guest. After being trained as a physician at the University of Vienna, Austria, Johannes Fresnelli was a visiting scientist in the research labs in Philadelphia, um, Dresden, Germany, Stockholm, Sweden, and Bozen, Italy. He is currently a professor of human anatomy at the University of Quebec at Trois-Rivières, as well as a regular researcher at the Research Centre of Saint-Cœur Hospital in Montreal. His research focuses on the physiology, the psychology, and the pathology of the sense of smell. And he joins us now from his office in Montreal. Welcome, Johannes. It's so great to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. All right, great. Um, so let's talk, before we get into all of these juicy topics, what was your earliest, most memorable sense of smell? Like, how old were you and what was it? Yeah, it's, I, I had the, the chance to grow up in a very beautiful part of the world. I grew up in the north of Italy, uh, in the Dolomites. Uh, and I remember that the seasons all came with a very distinct uh, smell. I cannot say this one was the first, but of course we had all the, the smells around Christmas time, the, the cloves and, and cinnamon and so on. And then later on, we would have the, the different smells that were associated with Carnival. And then we would have the spring with, with uh, apple flowers uh, and, and so on. And the whole year round, the every month, every season came with a very, very distinct uh, smell. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I go back home uh, now in the different seasons of the year, I can still smell them. And it really brings me back to my childhood. Hmm, that's lovely. Very Proustian, as we all know that, you know, beginning of uh, time lost and remembrance of time lost. I'm sure you've had this uh, put back to you all the time, but it, it's, it's actually not the taste of the cookie, but the smell of that Madeleine cookie that sets off all his memories. But um, so um, when did you first become fascinated with the subject of smell, the science of it, uh, to study it? Yeah, this this is also quite well. I think interesting story. When I when I was a student in in Vienna, so I moved away from small town Meran in in north of Italy and and went to study when I was eighteen years old and went to the big city in Vienna, and there uh, Vienna has has a, a tradition of having those outdoor markets uh, where you can uh, whole year round you can get different kinds of foods and vegetables, but also spices. And there's a lot of people from 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 Turkey from the Middle East that are selling their products there and this was for me a lot of new smells and lo a lot of uh, new tastes and new flavors that I that I that I just kind of organically uh, learned there we would go there on Saturday and and get our stuff and it was much cheaper than the rest and and in parallel to that I did my studies and at some point during during towards the end of my studies I I had the opportunity to to do a medical doctoral thesis which is not at all like a PhD thesis much smaller and 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 I thought, oh, that's interesting. And the topic was the sense of smell in people with chronic kidney disease. And I came from the kidney side, actually. But I thought, oh, wow, the sense of smell, we can actually study that, tell, that too. And all of a sudden, I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm about to combine that what's interesting for me in my private life, in my personal life, with what is interesting for me in my professional life. And, and I started out with that. I, I did not have the intention to to 
do that for the rest of my life. But then as the year went by, at some point I realized I am much more interested in the sense of smell than I am interested in medicine. So I went on with that. So you made a bridge there. That's fascinating. Um, and what's the most surprising thing that you've discovered about our sense of smell in, in your research so far? I mean, in, in, in the very beginning, what I was very uh, surprised about is how, how little we know about the sense mm -hmm. of smell. So this was, uh, I would go back 1999, 2000. And I think over those last 25 years, a lot of things have happened. A lot of things have happened also with the sense of smell. Uh, but, but so the first surprising thing is how little we know. And then uh, the next surprising thing was in 2004 uh, when the uh, when we received uh, when, when a Nobel Prize was attributed uh, for the discoveries on the sense of smell. And and that, that was then also a surprising uh, thing, of course. Uh, and and then when later COVID came around, it was again surprising that the sense of smell is so central uh, in the in the early screening for the disease and is so heavily affected. And it mm -hmm. was also surprising before we talked about COVID is how many people suffer from a smell dysfunction. It's approximately 20 percent. This is before COVID wow. came around. And okay. then I think the next surprising thing is how little people were aware of that. And, and then once COVID hit uh, and people would become more aware about it, then uh, it was surprising how, how, uh, how interested and fascinated the whole population would get uh, with regards to the sense of smell. So from not knowing anything to being very aware of the importance of the sense of smell. Yeah, it's been a whole cultural change for sure. Um, and I know in the wine and food worlds, it's become important. I see profiles all the time of a certain chef or sommelier lost their sense of smell due to COVID. Uh, most of them were happy stories in the end. They got it back. But we're going to dive more into sense of smell and disease because that is just fascinating. If there's one myth that you wanted to debunk or dispel about our sense of smell, what would well, that I be? Well, I think the most central one, and I guess the people listening to us know about that, uh, the most central one is that once we have something in our mouth, uh, we, we talk about taste, uh, but it's actually not taste most of it what we perceive but it's the it's uh, it's olfaction it's retronasal olfaction as the odor molecules enter the nasal cavity from the back door the, through the the pharynx through the throat and and what we can taste with our tongue is sweet sour bitter salty and umami and all the mm -hmm. rest is actually olfactory perception hmm. yeah absolutely why why do you think smell is underrated why of all the like you know the um sight is the they, I think you've said it or somebody said it in an interview with you. It's the, 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 the sense of, of science. It's highly respected. It's cerebral. Why, why does smell get a bad rap? Is it because it's so animalistic or base well, or I, old? I, I, I think there's definitely something to it. There is, there is a very interesting paper that came out uh, five, six years ago by John McGann. And, and he described that uh, the, 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 there is a myth about us not having a good sense of smell compared to other mm -hmm animals and I think we're going to talk about that uh, later yeah. but but this this has its roots in the 19th century uh, where the whole Darwinian ideas came up and and became more important and all of a sudden uh, we were just another animal uh, and and not this this creation of God that's that stands out and so m different players including the Catholic Church and so on had to make sure that we are different uh, from from other animals and and so we would look at what what does make the human they looked at it what makes the human human well it's sight where we can read with it it's 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 language where we can talk so it's 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 audition and 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 so these senses of course they're very developed for us humans but these senses were the senses that we distinguish ourselves from the animals and the other senses where animals may be outperforming us while well, these are then lower senses uh, yeah. and 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 the, the consequence of this is that we a thought this is a lower sense and b this is less important for us but as a secondary result of this is that we would then also we as mankind would much, put much less effort into understanding how the sense of smell works because that's something that was reserved for for rats and dogs and and other uh, species like this right so less research dollars and so on when it's yet still so fundamental to to being human um there was a, a really interesting study with graduate students i think who are given a choice between their sense of smell and their their phones or something like this maybe just tell us what that study was about well there there, there is this study where exactly i, I think it was uh, rachel hertz who, who did this study where, where um graduate students were asked which uh what they would give up uh, for 
some item and and so it, it was shown that they would be very hesitant to give up a vision for for their cell phone if they had to choose between keeping their cell phone and, and keeping uh, the vision then they, they chose vision but if they gave the, the option if they if they got the option to you know give up smell uh, and uh, or the cell phone then the the, the choices were uh, quite different and the people were or the participants were quite readily uh, ready to 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 give up uh, the sense of smell. This is this is one study, but this is this is consistently found when we when we ask people uh, what is the most important sense and which is the, the least important sense. Which one would you give up if you had to, and so on? Uh, the sense of smell always comes up last, and it's. I think this may change a little bit, and this may have changed uh, with the context of of, of of COVID, as we as we already discussed, where beforehand. Uh, people that have lost their sense of smell, they really were exotic. Nobody talked about it, although it's very widespread. But, you know, if somebody said, I cannot smell, then the other said, well, you know, you're lucky you can't smell, you know, the people in, in, in the bus or, or the yeah. diapers or whatever. But I think uh, there was all of a sudden much more awareness how important it is to have a good sense of smell. And, and now, of course, I mean, this audience n knows it very well. Um, but I, I think this is a common misconception that the sense of smell is less important uh, than, 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 than it actually is for us. Because it's not just smelling flowers and so on, because the sense of smell has much more implications. And I'm sure we will be talking about that as well. Absolutely. I'm just hearing a little low rustle. I think maybe your speaker might be rubbing on your shirt. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, uh, let but me. Can that's I okay. change the It's, it's gone now. Um, so it's good now. But it, I think it just when you might be sitting back talking, it might be rustling okay. against well, your shirt. Well, let me not sit back then anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, don't relax. Um, <laughs> okay, that that's great. Um, Okay, yeah, because I, I'm fascinated with this. E even in something like as simple as a tomato, there are 200 odors. Like we're going to get into this. So first, though, let's let's walk through how smell works. You started on this, but what's what's the basic anatomy from odor molecules in the wine glass? How do they get up to our brain? Yes. So first, we need to have an, an odor source uh, in which the odor molecule is, is stored. So this can be a liquid like wine. This can be a solid substance. This can be gas. <clears throat> and this, this, from this odor source, the odor molecules have to reach the air. So they have to be volatiles. And they can reach the air uh, either by evaporation or because it is heated up or whatever. Uh, and then they are in the air surrounding our body. They can be also inside our body if they are in the mouth. And then we, we breathe in. As we breathe in, actually what happens is, is I contract the muscles of my diaphragm and I create a, a, a vacuum uh, or under pressure in my lungs and then air is sucked in to, to counter that. And if I, my mouth is closed, the air goes through my nose. And with this air, uh, all the molecules that are found in the air and not just the odor molecules, also viruses and bacteria and, and dust and whatever will come into our nose, will be filtered. Um, and the odor molecules will reach the upper portion of the nasal cavity, uh, really the, 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 the roof of the nasal cavity. And in this uh, portion of the nasal cavity, we have a specific uh, epithelium. We have specific cells in the mucosa. And these cells, the odor receptor cells, uh, <clears throat> have on their surface uh, little proteins, and if these uh, receptors, olfactory receptors, and if the if if the odor molecules fit to this uh, olfactory receptor, then something happens in the chain, in in, in the cell, in the cell, a change, a, a chain reaction of things happen, and the end result of that is is that the so-called action potential, an electrical signal, is created in the olfactory uh, receptor cell, and this electrical signal is then conveyed via the olfactory nerve into the brain, into the olfactory bulb that's located above our eyes, between our eyes and above it. And from there, then we have uh, different other processing steps uh, until the information, now this is now an electrical information, this is not the odor molecule anymore, will then reach the centers of the brain that are responsible for processing and for perception of uh, uh, olfaction. Hmm. Wow. Um, and what about the trigeminal nerve? Is it involved in yes. the smell and wine tasting? So Per se, smelling is limited to what I just said. Of course, the odor molecules that, that we have, uh, and not just the odor molecules, other things that we could find in there, they may stimulate other uh, uh, receptors of our body, other uh, uh, um, organs of our body. And for example, if we have wine in our mouth, the same thing happens that I just said before. So volatiles will be uh, come out of the liquid and then be in the air and reach the nasal cavity. 
Uh, but of course, also the, the liquid in the mouth will stimulate the, 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 the receptors in the mouth, the gustatory receptors. So it will be sour, it will be sweet. Uh, but it will also stimulate the alcohol, for example, has a smell, but the alcohol will also activate other receptors that are located on the trigeminal nerve. So they per se have nothing to do with the sense of smell. They will then be perceived as stinging. Like, for example, if you have a glass of cognac in front of you and you take a sniff, you can clearly perceive the, the stinging of the alcohol. But this is another nerve. But this is because usually we experience smell and this stinging or tickling or burning or cooling or whatever, we perceive them together. And so they are processed in the same areas of the brain and they kind of belong together. So if you have a very strong, uh, strong wine with, I don't know, 15% or something, you will perceive on the one hand the flavors from the wine, but we also will perceive the alcohol, the smell of the alcohol, but also the, the very distinct sensation, trigeminal sensation of the alcohol. And this will all be processed together and belongs together uh, because the flavor perception is the, is the ensemble of the uh, perceptions of the sensations that we have during uh, the, 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 the <clears throat> perception of something in our mouth. Hmm. And the trigeminal nerve, is it along our jawline or back under our ears? Well, the Where trigeminal nerve, the trigeminal nerve is a so-called somatosensory nerve. So it's the nerve that is responsible for the innervation of the, the skin of our face, also of the mucosa. So if you touch your, your, your forehead or if you, you know, hit your, your jaw, then the perception that you have is from this trigeminal nerve. So it's responsible for the innervation of the skin, also of the mucosa. If I touch your tongue, you perceive this with the trigeminal nerve. If you go to the dentist, he will freeze either yeah. one branch, the lower branch or the middle branch of the trigeminal nerve so that he can do his whatever he wants to do on your teeth or whatever he has to do. So that's all the trigeminal yeah. nerve. But this trigeminal nerve, as I said, is also responsible for the, for the mucosa, so for the insides, for, also for the eye, and allows us to perceive pain, but also allows mm -hmm. us to perceive uh, tickling, burning, fresh, freshness, cooling, uh, mm -hmm. spiciness, and, and all these different kind of perceptions. Wow, fascinating. All right, so, and, and that sort of explains why we have a stuff, when we have a stuffy nose, we lose our sense of taste. So flavor, I think you've already alluded to this, is not those five basic tastes in our mouths, it's the combination of taste and smell working together, yes. right? Exactly, so in, in, in the common, in the everyday language, there's often a misconception between flavor and taste. So from a neurophysiological point of view, and I guess it's also from the point of view of, of uh, wine connoisseurs, the, the taste is actually only sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. So this is perceived via the, 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 the sense of taste. Uh, different nerves, again, different receptors. They're located mainly on the tongue, in the papilla of the tongue. Uh, then we have the, the smell perception uh, that takes place via the olfactory nerve, as I explained before. Then we have trigeminal perception. It's, again, a different nerve. And then we have other perceptions, such as the texture, the coolness, the warmth, the, uh, the, we feel liquid, we feel the crunchiness or, or, of something. We even hear what's going on in our mouth. We, we see what, what we are eating and so on. And the, the, all these different uh, sensory modalities together form a unique perception in our brain, and this is flavor perception. So we mm -hmm. cannot really completely uh, discriminate or separate them from each other because what happens in the brain is that these informations that come from different sensory channels are all put together, are processed in, in overlapping brain areas, and then this unique uh, perception is created. So if you eat a, a pineapple, for example, you will have sweetness and sourness from the pineapple. You have the flavor, you have the, the aromas from the pineapple. You feel the cooling, you feel the acidity that maybe stings a little bit and so on. And all this together gives you the flavor of a pineapple. So the flavor of a pineapple is all these sensations together. Hmm. Wow. So it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, humans have about 400 types of scent receptors. Dogs have closer to 1,000. So what do dogs experience in terms of scent that we can't? Um, and is there anything we can learn wine-related from that? So I think... Uh, yes, you're right. We have uh, approximately 400 uh, different uh, olfactory receptors, but these are, th this number is not exactly 400. Maybe you have 420 and I have only 380, and the 380 that I have don't overlap completely with the, with the 420 that you have. So already from that perspective, our olfactory world is a little bit different. To make this understandable, let's, let's look at the different sense. Let's look at the sense of vision. In vision, we have four different receptors. We have one receptor for black and white, and then we have three uh, receptors for colors, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And with these four different receptors, we are able to see all the beauty of the, of the, the 
the rainbow and, and the spring and the fall and, and, and whatnot. Um, there are some people amongst us that do not have four receptors, they only have three. They are missing one of those receptors, typically it's the red receptor, and so they have a hard time distinguishing red and green. And red and green uh, both look at them for them a little bit grayish. If somebody is colorblind, as this condition is called, it's very difficult for them to imagine how red and green would, li would look like. And the same is for us who are not colorblind. Uh, if we have four receptors, imagine if we would have a fifth receptor, some birds have a fifth receptor, how the world would look different. We have no idea. We cannot imagine these additional uh, colors. Now imagine in the photo sense of smell, we don't have five or six, we have 400. So the dimensionality of our perception is just extremely more vast, but it's even more so for dogs. And as I, as, as I said, we, you have maybe 420 and I have 380. So already on that level, your olfactory world is, would be more complex and would be definitely be different than mine. But the one of dogs and rats and mice that have way more receptors than we have must be so much more complex, but it's, it's not conceivable uh, for us. So uh, just like we cannot imagine additional colors to the one that we already see. And is it, um, is it, uh, true, or am I referring to some other sort of science? Do women tend to have more scent receptors than men, or uh, is that taste buds? No, it is. It is not so much that that the women that women have more uh, receptors than men. This is pretty equal the number of receptors. Nevertheless, women usually outperform men in smell tests, or let, let's put it differently. It's not always that we find sex differences, but if we find sex differences, then usually female participants outperform the male participants. Why this is like this, we do not know. Is that, has it some, something to do with really the olfactory apparatus being better in, better, better performing in, uh, in female versus male? Or is it that, uh, that women have, uh, have superior um, you know, language abilities that is known, and this could be then the, the, the outcome could be influenced by that because, you know, often these are older identification tests and, and women, you know, so you have to match a label to the older and if you have uh, superior language skills, then this task would be more easily uh, performable. Or has it something to do with, uh, with hormones because the, the difference tends to disappear after menopause, men menopause or other yeah. factors add to those. So it's not entirely clear uh, why, uh, why this is uh, like this. It could be also a cultural phenomenon. So you may have noticed that I use male and female and men and women interchangeably. We do not know if it's related to sex or gender because it could be also a cultural uh, phenomenon uh, because in our societies, um, women uh, as, uh, assign a more important role to olfaction. It's typically the, the mother who is responsible for preparing food, who is responsible for the hygiene of the family, for washing and so on. And, and this uh, may be then, you know, already uh, 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 given on to, to young girls and, and, and uh, young women, that they are just more interested in that. I can see that in my research, uh, I have a, uh, I'm in the Department of Anatomy and I have a colleague who works on, um, spinal cord injury. And when I look for graduate students, 90 to 95% of the candidates are women, and only few men are there. And at my colleagues, 90 to 95% of the people that are interested in that topic are men, and there's nearly no woman participating. So <clears throat> it's clearly that olfaction seems to be more attractive uh, to, uh, to, to women as a subject. When we look for participants for our studies, we always have a much easier time to find women uh, than, than men. So I think that the topic of smell seems to be more interesting for, for women than for men. Why this is like this, we, don't, we do not know. Where does it start? Where does it end? That we don't know. But typically, to come back, if we find a difference in smell tests uh, between, between the sexes, it's typically the women that perform better than the men. Fascinating. And certainly just my perception is that the market for perfume is far larger for women, the brands and variations, than it is for exactly. men. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so are we better at smelling wine than dogs? Is there something going on there? So, yeah, this is, this is a very, very interesting and fascinating question. So we just discussed that, that dogs have so much more uh, receptors than, yeah. than humans, and they also outperform us in many tasks, right? We, we, hire, we, we don't hire a human to, to sniff around at the airport. 
We have dogs to do that. Uh, again, it's not all dogs that, that, that can do that. And we humans, we can also train different things. We can, we can, we can follow a trace of odors in, uh, on, on, on the field. Uh, we can, from body odors, we can recognize if somebody is healthy or sick, if somebody is a man or a woman, if somebody is older or young, just as dogs, not as, as highly performing. But the, the big difference, uh, so if, if we talk about the receptors, of course, dogs have way more receptors than we have. But the receptors is not the whole story. Because as I said before, the information is then passed on to the olfactory bulb and then to the brain. And in the brain, it's further processed. And we humans, we have one thing that is particularly uh, big and performing in our body, and that's our brain. We have, compared to most other animals, a very big brain, a very high-performing brain. So even if we get less information from, from the, the receptors, because we have less receptors, our brain is much more performing and can do much more with this sparse information compared to dogs. <clears throat> and, you know, we can, <clears throat> we can talk about uh, odors to each other. You can learn something from what I tell you. Dogs do not have uh, this kind of, of abilities. And it has also been shown that with regards to um, odors that are re uh, related to fermentation, so that's interesting in the context of wine, we humans are particularly sensitive, and this maybe have an evolutionary advantage. Imagine our ancestors walked through the savanna. The, the last antelope has been a while, and there is a, a tree far down with you know semi-ripe fruits or ripe fruits. It was important for our ancestors to be able to to smell are these fruits ripe if they fall down if they start to ferment then it becomes interesting for, for us we we are very sensitive to these kind of odors much more sensitive than carnivores that couldn't care less about uh, an, an an apple or 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 something like that <clears throat> so so we have uh, we have less receptors but we have a better performing brain and we can use the information that we get and we can we can really apply it and we have developed over the the history of mankind we have developed so many uh, techniques to process our food fermentation is just one of it fermentation of of uh, grapes of course but fermentation of uh, of wheat for beer fermentation of milk to cheese um, we have developed different cooking techniques from braising to grilling to steaming to whatever this is all be done so that we can uh, that we can uh, you know, process, uh, that we can not only process the food, but also that we can take way more out of the food that we are uh, ingesting. And on the way to this, we have developed also these abilities, sensory abilities with regard to these, to these items that I just said. And, and wine is, of course, the most prominent of that, um, where, we, where we have developed really superior things. So <clears throat> a dog could never replace a sommelier. Uh, who was I always to, wondered why there weren't dogs somewhere. <laughs> yes, because we have to have so many, uh, so much information that is very human related to that, those abilities that the dog, the dog is probably better, would be better in detecting if there's a cork smell in the wine than mm. we are. But that's okay. not the only thing that uh, a sommelier does. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, the dog would also have problems ordering from wineries and there'd be a lot of complications <laughs> yes. for the dog. But anyway, exactly. um, so so we have on average, may, maybe say 400 scent receptors, um, but we can smell or detect um, more than a trillion different odors. How do we get that many odors exactly. from so <laughs> few receptors? Yes. It's again. I let's let's look at the analogy of of color. We have three receptors for color, but we cannot just see three colors. We can see a multitude right. of colors because we can mix those together. And the receptors that we have, they do not respond to individual odors. So we do not have a vanilla receptor and a rose receptor and a jasmine receptor because if that were the case, we would indeed only be able to smell four hundred different things. But our sense of smell doesn't work like this. These receptors do not respond to individual odors, but they rather respond to so-called functional groups in the odor molecules. So in order to understand it, we have to, every odor at the basis is a chemical substance. Uh, and if we have the, uh, you know, let's say the odor of coffee, there is 200, 400 different uh, chemical substances in this smell. And each chemical substance has a chemical formula that has some characteristics. And for example, it can be a sulfur uh, somewhere in, in, in the chemical formula, it can be an alcoholic functional group, or it can be a double bind or double bound, or something like that, a certain uh, carbon chain length and so on. And our sense of smell, the receptors that we have, they do respond to the presence or not of these, uh, these physical 
chemical characteristics of the chemical st structures. So this means that every odorant that contains, let's say, a sulfur atom in its chemical formula will activate the receptor that responds to this sulfur component and so on. And so we have basically, we, can s we, we experience our world in 400 different dimensions. This is a little bit uh, simplified, but basically our apparatus says of those 400 different uh, um, the, uh, 400 different uh, uh, things that I'm looking out, are they present or not in the ensemble of odors, uh, odorants that are entering the nose? And this information is then conveyed on to the, to the brain and is then further processed. And this means that if we have odors that are chemically very similar, they will have a quite similar uh, smell. But that's not the whole story. Uh, we also have chemicals that are not uh, very similar from a chemical point of view, but they still uh, smell uh, the same. And that means we do not have complete understanding of our sense of smell works. And this is, this is also something that's quite puzzling. For vision, we know for 150 years what are the underlying principles of uh, visual perception. And for hearing, it's also 100 years. For, for, for smelling, we lack 100, 100 years behind compared to those mm -hmm. other senses. And we have not even understood some of the basic principles of how our, senses, how, how our sense of smell works. So if we now create a new substance in a, you know, let's say chemical factory, and this substance is volatile and has a certain, is not too big, is not too small, we can now predict that it has a smell, but we cannot predict what will it smell like. We do not know that yet. <laughs> wow, so much. It's exciting, the potential there for people yes, like you indeed. in that field. Yes. Yeah. But, um, wow. Um, so why are our wine aromas or aromas in general so vivid? Um, they can evoke these memories. You talked about going right back to your childhood for those seasonal smells. Mm -hmm. Why is smell so powerful, much more powerful than say sight or yes. audi audition? Yeah. So the, the, before when I explained how the information is processed, at some point the information will come to the brain and this then process will become, uh, con we will be become conscious of what's going on. The regions of the brain that are responsible for olfactory processing belong to the limbic system. And these regions of the brain, and that's an exception of the brain, they are not just responsible for olfactory processing of the processing of smell stimuli, they are also responsible for other functions of the brain, such as uh, emotions, memory, learning, reward. All these regions are, uh, all these functions are uh, processed in the same areas of the brain. And that's an exception, as I said. For example, in vision, it's the occipital cortex that's responsible for, for visual processing. This cortex, this part of the brain, does not do anything else, just processing of visual information. And so we're very good at it. There's a huge chunk of our brain is, resp is, is, is reserved for that. But for uh, the sense of smell, it is different. It's, it, it is part of the limbic system. So when we smell something, the centers of the brain that are responsible for smell processing, but that are also responsible for memories, for emotions or for reward are activated by this smell stimulus. And mm -hmm. such, just like we remember a very emotional situation much easier than a very boring one, also a smell can activate those centers and the smell can trigger memories that have been created in the moment when we smelled this odor that were often emotional and that we remembered. So when we then smell this odor, then the, 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 the memory to this event will be triggered. And, and what triggers these odors is very individually different from one person to the next. It could be something for you, it could be something else for me. For me, for example, it's burnt rubber. When I was a child, eight years old, we had a uh, somebody lit a car in, in our backyard. The guy was never found, but I woke up in the middle of the night from the, from, you know, the, the light from the firefighters and the sounds and the smells. And to this day, whenever I smell the burnt uh, rubber as the burnt uh, tires that I smelled that night, I was not scared that night. I found it more fascinating for an eight-year-old boy. It's great, the firefighters are there. It's action in the middle of the night. Everybody's awake. So it was very exciting for me. But when I smell burnt rubber today, then I, I'm directly brought back to this moment. I do not have this effect when I see firefighters or when I, when I hear them or, or, or even if I see a fire. This does not have the, the effect on me. But every time I smell uh, burnt rubber, sure enough, I will be back uh, eight years old looking down to this uh, burning, burning car. So, and the underlying principle is the anatomical identity of the regions that are involved that are responsible for smell processing, memories, 
and for emotions. Wow. I can so relate. Like, and any time this is going to sound weird, but any time I smell a National Geographic magazine, I'm right back in my grandfather's veranda because I just love the sun was coming in. I'm smelling the magazines, couldn't kind of read them, but and I remember him and the, the fond memories of summer. And it was just it's the weirdest thing. So I love sniffing magazines. Exactly. <laughs> kind of strange. And, and, yeah. And, but this is this makes it also so difficult to study all this because the odors. Right that are responsible for these for for for, for this Proust phenomenon in in all of us are different you know for me right. I, I happen to also like that smell but not everybody has the same reaction to these odors and it's extremely difficult to afterwards find the odors the precise odors that are responsible for these for for, for these memories yeah they're so individual the limbic system reminds me of an apartment with four roommates whereas whatever that corti cortex that is processing site, that's like a single dwelling home. <laughs> like it's yes. just focused and on I, one I thing. Also <laughs> think, I also think uh, the, the limbic system is, is, a, uh, is, is roommates that hang out together, do a lot of things yeah. together. They, they mix up between them, whereas the, yeah. the visual system is more like an, an office building. Everybody has his office and walks out and walks in and do, does not have too yeah. much interaction with the other ones around it. That's but right. another, That's right. another consequence of this, the limbic system is very poorly related to our language areas. So we oh. have a hard time. We have a hard time describing our emotions. We also have a hard time describing uh, yes. smells. So it's, it's really something that is difficult for us. It's much different for a visual uh, input. And this also means that we can modulate much more easily. If I, with the expectations, I can, we did studies on that. We, we can create an expectation and this can then modulate uh, the, the olfactory perception that we have. We did this with Parmesan cheese where we gave our participants Parmesan cheese to smell and told them this is Parmesan cheese. And you know, they liked it and they said I they would eat something like this. And later on we came back with the same smell, but we told them now this is, this is uh, dried vomit. And they said, yeah, this oh. is dried vomit. This is gross. Would never touch, would never eat something like this, but it was Parmesan cheese. And we wow. can do this with smells. We cannot do this with, with, with images. I cannot tell you this is now an image of Parmesan cheese and show you Parmesan cheese. You say, yeah, I see this is Parmesan cheese. And later on say, this is fresh vomit and, or dried vomit. Mm -hmm. And say, no, I can see this is it's Parmesan true. cheese. So it's much more uh, modulable and it's much more difficult to, to describe. And what sommeliers have the ability to do is to find to have a common language for the smell perceptions that that they have i'm i'm a wine lover but i'm not at all a specialist and i can sit with my friends and we drink a good bottle of wine and then we start to freely associate uh, this is vanilla or tobacco or berries or barrique or whatnot and all of, and all of us are right because i can say it reminds me of vanilla and nobody can say you, you're not right but what the the sommeliers are able to do is that they smell the wine, they taste the wine, they can then use precise descriptors that another sommelier that went through the same school is able to pick up and can understand how this, uh, how this wine smells and tastes like without having to taste this wine. And this ah. is what they are training. And this is what the sommelier training is really all about, that they are bad, getting better in describing odors and not so much that they get more sensitive to odors. Right. So more precise, universal language that is consistent. Exactly. Um, do the, is, is the best, if we want to become better tasters and smellers, um, I would think pay attention to the smells in your life. Like when you cut over the open vegetables or fruits, they're more pungent. But do those vendonay kits help? Like the, the, they, they sell the vials, little essences of cinnamon and whatever, and you sniff and then you try to find it in the wine. Do you think those really help us? So, so we have done different studies, not with those ones, but we have done different studies with people who have lost their sense of smell, COVID right. or other viral infections. We have done uh, studies with people, you know, students that have a normal sense of smell, young people. We have done uh, studies with sommelier students, and we have done studies with, uh, some, with master sommeliers, so high-end uh, sommeliers. And in all these studies, people did olfactory training, and in all these studies, their sense of smell got better. And in all these studies, we also saw effects on the structure of the brain. But what is the key uh, takeaway here is that you have to do something that is challenging uh, for the individual in question. So, which means that if we take people that have lost their sense of smell and do a smell training, where they basically smell four different odors and just try to see, try to smell, do you smell something? Do I perceive something? Yes or no. That is challenging for them because they can't smell or they can smell very little. And this right. is 
this is, uh, this is uh, useful for them. With the students that we tested, we cannot do this kind of test uh, or this kind of training because it's, it's, it would not help them. They, 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 they need something that is challenging for them, for appropriate for them. And so is, is for the, the so many students. We did not formally train them, but they got the training in, in, uh, during, during the, 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 their training, uh, one and a half years of training. And the same is with sommelier, uh, master sommeliers. They, they exercise themselves, they train themselves, but it has to be always something that is challenging. It mm -hmm. is like when you do sports, you go to the gym. If somebody's mm -hmm. a newbie, well, uh, you know, 50 minutes on, on the bike will be enough to get some training effect. If somebody uh, runs a marathon uh, every, every other week, 50 minutes on a bike won't have any effect uh, on them. And it's the same for the brain. And what we can train most about smells is really, you know, if we described the olfactory apparatus before, is the brain. So what we can train most is the connection with the language. And so I think what is extremely important is that we talk about the smells, that we communicate, that we exchange with each other, uh, that we see what do you think, what do I think. So it's not enough to just be at home, watch TV and have odors go by, a you know, conveyor belt of odors. That would probably not have a huge effect, but you have to actively uh, try to work with the odors and working is smelling, trying to do tasks, trying to, uh, to talk about it, get feedback. And I think that is what really helps and what can make uh, our sense of smell better. Yes, I, I've heard that, that it's not just paying attention, it's actually saying it out loud really helps. Like it's probably activating different types, maybe even writing it down might be a different mode and really trying to cement in, okay, that's cinnamon. Um, that kind of thing. And you, you said, I think you alluded to this, but are, have there been studies that show that the brains of well-trained sommeliers are more active or more developed in this capacity? Yes, yes, indeed. We, we did this with the master sommeliers where we looked at the, 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 the different regions of the brain. Now, they are quite difficult to, to get a grasp on. We were able to include, I think, 13 of them is a study that within Las, we did in Las Vegas because I didn't know that, but there's a lot of master sommeliers in Las Vegas yes. and we were able to have everybody, uh, all the master sommeliers of Las Vegas uh, participate in, this, in that study. And hmm. so we looked at their brain and what we saw is that one region of the brain, the entorhinal cortex, which is part of the limbic system, uh, which is also and mainly responsible for memory, the uh, entorhinal cortex, so the, the, the surface of the brain in this specific area, in the sommelier, master sommeliers got bigger the longer they had been working, the older they, they were. Usually, the older we get, the thinner the cortex gets. We lose gray matter, we lose uh, neurons during our life. But in these master sommeliers, we had the inverse effect. They got thicker. So it looks like that they're, the job that they're doing, their profession that leads them to smell very actively, to work with the sense of smell, to, re to memorize uh, odors, to memorize other things, makes it in a way that the, the cortex in these areas of the brain gets thicker with age and not thinner. So that's extremely interesting because, yeah. you, know, it, you know, it means that we have probably some plasticity in the brain, but it also backs, backs, leads us to the question, hmm, does that also mean that because the limbic system is not just responsible for smelling, but also to emotions and to uh, and, and responsible for for memory. Do they also have better memory? Are they more? Do they have a better memory when they're older? Are they more protected from um, dementia? Are they more protected from Alzheimer's disease? Are they more protected from, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, depression? Uh, something that is related with with emotions. So so. These are, these are questions that we do not have the answers to yet. It's also quite difficult to study from a scientific perspective, uh, but uh, it's something that I would definitely want to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I touched on that in my opening questions, but uh, is, is there some sense that it would be good to have these smell tests as, a, as regularly as we have eye exams so that perhaps they could be predicting if we're susceptible to getting Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? Now, um, I don't think we are there yet. I think we okay. need, because it's also quite time consuming, it's costly, and the benefit mm -hmm. of uh, having uh, smell exams is relatively limited, especially because we do not have too much uh, we can do afterwards. If somebody can't see well, well, we can put glasses on. If somebody doesn't hear well, we have AIDS. With the sense of smell, we are not there yet. Uh, right. It's also that the smell impairment gives us information about you know, some, the state 
with regards to some the state of the brain with regards to some medical conditions parkinson's alzheimer's and so on but also there we do not have yet interventions that actually allow us to to say with confidence it would be good to do that now so mm-hmm. i think we are we're going this in this direction and i think that the sense of smell will just become more and more important and we will be more and more aware uh, of of the of, of of the implications of all of this uh, but we need to, to do more research hmm. excellent all right and so how do um emotional states like stress or relaxation influence our ability to perceive scent i'm assuming if we're stressed we're not smelling as much or are we hyper critical aware of scents um this i mean there there is no straightforward uh connection there uh there is there is indirect connections i would say for uh, for first and foremost if we are focusing on something, well, we don't focus on something else. So we would have a harder time probably focusing on, on, on smells. It may be also that when we are stressed that we breathe differently and breathing is an integral part of the, uh, the olfactory processing cascade, uh, if you want so. Um, and uh, so generally speaking, there, it, it's not that there is a direct link there. Um, but like with everything, if we, you know, it's like with uh, sound, uh, if you go, if you go visual testing, you don't have something going on in the background while you're trying to read the letters. Uh, I have good eyesight, so I do not know exactly what happens uh, when you go to, to eye test. Uh, or when you have a hearing test, you try to do that in a calm environment. And the same is with, with smelling. You try to, to, uh, to make it in a way that, is, that, the, that, that the person is able to focus on uh, what's going on. And if you have something else in your mind, then, then you will be just uh, absent-minded. And we, you probably won't be able to perceive and especially appreciate uh, to that degree. For us, smelling is difficult. Uh, we can oversee a visual scenery very fast and, you know, we look, oh, I can see oh, this, is my, this is my wife and I can see her down there and we can focus. With smelling, we don't have these abilities. When we, have to, when we try to find something in a, let's say, an olfactory uh, scenery, it is much more work for us to detect these kind of things and we have to concentrate, we have to focus. We don't do it a lot. So you need to have the, the, the mental uh, uh, um, spare time or spare place to do that kind of uh, thing. Right, right. Picture, picture's worth a thousand words, but a scent is, I don't know, <laughs> worth one word, two words, or something. Um, yeah, it's a, lo- it's a lot harder. Um, and can you discuss the role of pheromones um, in human olfaction, whether they play a part, say, if we're tasting wine? Yes. And, and what so, pheromones I mean, are? Just a basic understanding. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the basic question is, do we have pheromones? Do we humans have pheromones? And uh, so far, the research... Uh, has not been able to identify any substance that could be classified as a pheromone. We have not. Uh, we have also not observed any mechanism, any phenomenon that could be explained by by pheromones. In other words, this is the strongest n- no that the scientists could say. We we don't know. Maybe we find at some point, but so far, in layman's term, humans do not have pheromones. We Just animals. In- uh, some animals, not all, some animals. not all animals. Some animals have also some mammals, uh, but in humans we have not found anything. It's probably also linked to the fact that we have this huge brain. Pheromones are substances, monomolecular substances produced by one individual of a species, uh, received by a second individual of the of the same species that evokes a very stereotypical reaction in this in the second uh, uh, individual. And in humans, we do not have stereotypical reactions. We can react even to the most unpleasant stimuli, pain. We can react differently. Some people hate pain, some people love pain. As we can see uh, people, you know, run marathons or people use very spicy food or people um, like uh, certain kinds of of, of sex uh, that involves pain just so even this very, very fundamental negative stimulus, pain, in humans does not evoke a stereotypical reaction, and even less so chemical substances. So if we look at this definition that I just gave you of pheromones, there is this stereotypical reaction that probably in humans does not exist, and therefore we do not have substances that, that fulfill these criteria, and therefore we probably do not have pheromones in humans. Uh, even if we had pheromones, they would probably mostly influence our interpersonal um, behavior, uh, that could be sexual, you know, between a man and a woman, or between man and, and, and uh, man and man, and women and women. 
But, you know, that's not all the pheromones we know from, from the animal kingdom. There's also pheromones between uh, mother and, 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 uh, and the child and newborn and so on and other uh, actions. But we do not have anything. And so, therefore, the, the influence on the wine uh, and uh, tasting and wine perception is for certainly limited hmm. okay. or at all cool. absent. Uh, this may or may not be related, but there was a study, maybe you did it, I'm not sure, but um, the sweaty t-shirts and horror movies, what, what was going on there? Yeah, so basically this is a study that showed that, that when, you, um, when you are, ex so I talked about pheromones a lot and, 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 and I said that probably we do not have pheromones, but this does not mean, I don't want to say that we don't influence each other via uh, our body odors. We do influence each other. This can go in many, many directions. And one of these directions is that we also convey information of our, about our emotional state. And the emotion, the basic emotions that we have, like fear and, and, and uh, joy and anger and, and disgust, so we can transport them via our, our body odor. We don't do that consciously. We don't perceive that consciously, but it influences us. And one of the studies is that, that um, um, people were exposed to, um, to so uh, let's, let's start differently. There were people that were parachuting, parachuting for the first time. Of course, it's something extremely stressful. They're really frightened. They're, you know, very scared. And the, the researchers gave them T-shirts in which they put some breastfeeding pads uh, under the, 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 the armpits uh, so that, they, that these breastfeeding pads would not collect breast milk, but rather the, the sweat of the people. And so they, they came down. Everybody you know, was, was okay afterwards. But they had, of course, of course been very, very scared. And so this, uh, these breastfeeding pads were collected and where then the odors in these breastfeeding pads, so the, the air was streaming over it, was presented to people that were watching horror movies. And when people, they didn't know what they were exposed to, they didn't know what this was, was the smell was uh, there, they did not even perceive a smell, but they, uh, uh, they experienced the horror movie as much more scary than huh. when they were exposed to uh, breastfeeding uh, pads of, of people that had been to the gym. So they had been sweaty too, they had been smelly too, but there is something in the smell, and we don't know what it is, we don't know if it's a molecule, if it's a combination of molecules, and so, but that <coughs> conveys this information. <coughs> and more on an anecdotal uh, note, uh, I'm, as I said, a professor for anatomy, so at the end of the semester we have anatomy uh, uh, exams, and that's something where students are usually also very scared, and mm -hmm. I have the impression, and I don't know, this is not scientific, when I enter the room and I see those students and I, I enter the room and I, I have the impression that I can feel, uh, their, I can smell their fear, uh, mm -hmm. even, as I said, if this is not scientific. Well, maybe so we are, you're sending out other orders like relax, relax, you'll be okay. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to <laughs> also to, to relax them by, by, you know, dropping a couple of jokes, but usually this doesn't work that well. I have, <laughs> I have learned. It's not the moment. Is it true we have something like 120 odors that compri comprise our body odor? It is, it is. Uh, so we, with our... Um, we don't know. That's the short answer. With our, with, we have sweat glands all over uh, our body. We have on our hands and our face and so on. And most of those glands, they produce only uh, water and salt. Uh, and they help us to, to regulate the temperature and maybe also the, the salt homeostasis. Uh, but we have some areas of the body in the armpit, in the anogenital region, where we have another type of glands. And th these glands, they do not just produce water and salt. They also produce a cocktail of substances. Uh, and different different substances. The composition of these of this uh, of this cocktail is individually different, and it's the compo this cocktail of substances that creates the very distinct body odor that each and every one of uh, of us has. But it's very difficult to measure, and it's very difficult to pinpoint what is actually the component that we makes us smell. In addition. These, the, 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 this cocktail of substances is influenced by what we eat. So if we eat garlic, we smell garlic. If we eat curry, we smell curry. curry. It depends on, um, uh, on, on our hygiene. If we shower every day or if we shower every, every five hours or if we shower once a, once a week, it depends on the, 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 the bacteria we have on, on, on our body uh, that then met, met metabolizes whatever comes there. It, it, it depends on the, you know, detergents that we use for our for our laundry and so on. So this of, of the perfumes we put on and so on. So when we perceive the body odor of somebody else, and also this is we perceive different 
parts, uh, then we, 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 we perceive it, but not necessarily consciously, but it's this cocktail of substances that is modulated and metabolized and so on that then creates this. It's also when two people come, it, come closer to each other, you know, if, if, you know, like, let's say from, from an from a office uh, um, mate to a intimate uh, sex partner, of course, you come in contact with uh, much much closer in different contexts, and the and and the, the the perception will also change, and the the the, the substances that we are exposed to. So uh, it is not easy. We cannot say we have a hundred, we have a hundred and twenty. There's many, many, but it's also different from one person to the next, and there's other stuff that is going on on the surface of our skin. Oh, so complex. Great. Um, and so when, when we come back to wine aromas, do we process those differently in our brain from synthetic artificial scents like perfumes or air fresheners? The thing is, um, at the basis, all smells are chemical substances. And um, so from that perspective, there is no difference. However, there is a difference. And the difference is the following. If we try to recreate, if you know, not we, if, if a company tries to recreate, let's say, the, the smell of, of onions for chips, uh, potato chips, uh, we can use actual onions and roast them. And then we have probably 200, 250 different molecules in this that we could then use on, 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 a, uh, on a spice or something that we put on, on the chips. Or we could see which are the most dominant of these uh, um, of these molecules, which are the ones that are in the highest concentration and do they smell like uh, onion? And then I take the top four and put them on it. And it's probably enough to create the sensation of an onion. So both will smell like onion, but it's not the same composition. So it cannot be excluded that this is perceived quite differently. And we all know that there is some artificial uh, uh, smells and flavors, and there is some that are more natural. And the artificial ones are typically way stronger, yeah. but it's it's due to what I just explained. There's usually just two, three substances that are used that are enough to make a, um, a candy smell like apple, but it is not the same thing as in the real apple because in the real apple, we have all these different odors. Hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when we have artificial scents, we often tend to have less, but also in higher concentrations. But because, you know, if you make five or 10% does not make a big difference anymore. So, so it is, uh, so then that you have much stronger odors. And this is a little bit the, the tricky issue with, with uh, olfactory marketing, for example, that is used by some companies, by hotels, by boutiques, uh, by, by clothing chains, uh, and so on, that, that, you know, use substances, but it could be attractive to some, but it could be very repellent for other people. And so you have to find the right balance uh, to say, okay, you know, I attract my, uh, the, the, the people that I want to have here and I don't care about the rest, but you have mm -hmm. to find the right, the, right, uh, the, the right level. And I think, you know, a factor marketing, again, if, if you have a, a bakery from the 19th century, it smells wonderful of, of, uh, of bread, you know, that's probably the best marketing that you could have. Mm, so to come absolutely. back to the question that you had about, about the wine, um, in wine, there is also, and I'm not a specialist of this, there is a multitude of, uh, uh, of substances that is uh, in there, and it's really in the, the ensemble of these substances that create the very distinct flavor that we perceive. Again, by the mm -hmm. sense of smell, it's the most important one, but then we also have the sense, we have all the other ones, taste and trigeminal and texture and whatnot that adds, and they then have this complete, uh, allow us to have the complete appreciation of the flavor. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You mentioned olfactory marketing, and I'm just reading lately that certain hotel chains have a certain smell. I guess they're putting it on the sheets, yeah. and the yes. even the um, the maids who are cleaning the rooms are wearing outfits that have this signature okay. smell. Yes, yes. Yeah, and and I think I mean the the idea the idea is clear. They try to create these olfactory memories and and a yeah. distinct signature. But it's it, it's you have to be careful. It's not that's you know, it's yeah, not could straight turn off some people. Yeah, exactly. I think there's even is it Lowe's or one of the hardware stores deliberately uses fresh cut wood and yet there's no wood being cut in the store, okay, yeah, but yeah. they're putting it into the store okay. just so you get that it's, smell. It's 
fascinating. Um, and retronasal, let's just, um, we had touched on it, but going back to that, is that after you um, taste the wine, heat it up, swallow it, and you breathe back through your nose? Is that the heated up molecules? Yes, is that it's, what it's, not, it's, not only, it's not only when you swallow it. It's also during okay. the, the, when you have it in the mouth, you know, when you have a, uh, when you watch a sommelier, and probably you do it too, if you take, take a, some, a, a sip and then... You make all these movements uh, in with mm -hmm. your tongue, with your palate, and so on to really appreciate. But by doing that, older molecules will already be pushed into the into the uh, nasal cavity, and you will already have the perception uh, of uh, you know the olfactory component, the retronasal component. You can test that by just pinching your nose. If you pinch your nose while right. you do that, you don't perceive anything. Because now that even if it's just blocked in the front, the air cannot enter because there's already air in there. And then okay. as soon as you release the nose, then you will have this additional dimension and you will really perceive it. So the, the, the sense of smell, retronasal affection is really the key player when it comes to flavor perception. <laughs> wow. Um, and is there, um, are there such things as ghost aromas? I, I'm not sure if I picked that up somewhere, but is there uh, such a thing? I, I'm, I, I do not know what that would refer to. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I was reading somewhere, but it might not have been in association to the work that you're you're doing. So no. I'll, uh, I'll have to Google that one again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so we talked about improving our sense of smell, um, the pathology of smell, being able to detect certain diseases we talked about. Um, maybe just um, talk about uh, synesthesia, where people see colors or shapes when smelling wine? Is that just a cross-modal, cross-wiring that's happening in the brain? Yeah, so it's not entirely clear what synesthesia is exactly. It's also not entirely clear who, how common this, this condition is. You have this, those very extreme cases uh, of people, you know, really having one modality activated and they have a very clear perception in, in another one. But, um, you know, even, you know, we can all be a little bit, uh, synesthetic if i ask you which of those two sounds is sharper is it bom bom or kek 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 you probably would say kek 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 is sharper so sharp it has nothing to do with with the sounds that i just made this is this is a it is a touch description uh, right. but you know we we use it for that so i think we are to some extent we are all a little bit synesthetic because we use these cross modal or we perceive cross modally uh, similar things but then you have the extreme where people really uh, you know have a have a have a taste and say this is blue um, i have a student who's you know completely uh, regular student, a very good student that said, yeah, he's a synesthet and for him is the days of the week they have clear colors. So hmm. Wednesday is yellow and the Thursday is green or something like that. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I asked somebody in the lab, we have 12 people in the lab, and said, oh yeah, I have that too. So apparently this is a very, uh, a quite common uh, condition. But I think what you're referring to is really these extreme cases of, of a synesthet, a stet, aesthetics where where we have this very strong not just you know these perceptions and uh, or the cross modal perceptions and th th the topic is very fascinating is also very difficult to study because what we try to do when we study something is to we try to group people together so that we compare one group we can compare one group with another group but if you have and, and this is the, the, the thing with synesthesia, it's extremely into, uh, individual. Some people have a synesthesia with this and some have it with something else. This makes it, again, very difficult to study, to understand exactly what's going on. But what we think, uh, or what is the, 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 the idea is that when we are born, a lot of the brain areas are interconnected with each other, that later in life, um, or these connections are not used later in life and then they're pruned away so they're just you know we, we don't need them so we don't use them and so it th these connections are, are not existing anymore and this is part of the maturation of the brain and it seems that in some people these connections do not uh, disappear and keep staying there and this would explain why when you have a visual input why this would then activate uh, auditory or, or olfactory uh, um, uh, sensation at the same time. Okay. Wow, wow. And then back to COVID, um, recovery, is it just a matter of genetics? I mean, you can, you, you're trying to help people recover by getting them to smell things, so maybe that's part of it. But in the end, whether people get their sense of smell back due to an illness, is that just genetics? Yes, it, it is. We, we do not know. We know 
anosmia and hyposmia, so the absence of the sense of smell and, and the reduced sense of smell, that existed already before COVID. And it, it's quite common. It's like one in five has, has, can either not smell at all or smell less. The, um, uh, the, in some of the people, the sense of smell can come back, so it can recover. And uh, the, the, um, the, the reasons uh, of, or the, 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 as I said, the factors that influence recovery um, are, that are known are three. First one is um, the cause of the olfactory dysfunction. So people that lost their sense of smell due to a viral infection of the upper respiratory tract, such as COVID or the flu or something like that, they have a higher probability to regain their sense of smell compared to people with a traumatic brain injury, concussion. The second is the right. age. Younger people have a higher uh, probability to recover the sense of smell compared to older ones. And the third one is the time, the interval since the loss of sense of smell. If you lost your sense of smell last week, it's highly probable that it will come back. If it's already four years, then it's less likely that, much less likely that it will come back. So these are the main, the main factors influencing uh, olfactory recovery. Unfortunately, this is on a group level again, but we can unfortunately not predict in a, in a specific person uh, why uh, the sense of smell comes back in one and the sense of smell does not come back in the other. And this is especially, especially uh, dramatic with, with COVID because COVID is a viral infection that affected a lot of young people. Before, it was usually older people, 55 and older, that would, uh, that would have um, uh, olfactory problems after a viral infection. With COVID, all of a sudden, we were young people. And in the acute phase, especially in the earlier variants, you would have 60, 70 percent of the people that lost their sense of smell. Fortunately, in most of the people, the sense of smell came back, but not in all. And some, some it came back, did not recover completely. Some came back, but they had uh, altered uh, smell perception uh, that got better after a while. Some, it comes back every time they have, they have a, a cold, it goes away again. So we do not yet know why some people have recovery and some people do not have recovery. Wow, so much to learn. What, um, what do you see? Uh, I mean, we've talked about so many areas that still need to be explored in as it relates to our sense of smell. What are you most excited about? What What are you working on? What are you looking forward to? Finding I mean, out? I'm my, my we are looking in my lab. We have two research axes. One axis is to understand how um, the, the smell testing will allow us to get more information about the brain and the health of the brain and the state of the brain. Uh, we could use that for early screening, for Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, and also to see who will have a long-term uh, consequence of a, a traumatic brain injury, such as depression or anxiety disorder. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is to better understand how multisensory integration takes place in, with the chemical senses. How do we integrate you know, the single in, uh, uh, um, uh, sensory channels into one percept, but also we're looking into plasticity in the uh, in the chemical senses. Can we train them? How does it get better? Uh, how do we improve our sense of smell? What happens with the brain if we improve our sense of smell? So that's oh, what we are doing great. in the lab. I think yeah. if we look at the scientific community uh, in general, something that is that is really the hot topic right now is with the advent of m new tools such as uh, artificial intelligence and so on, we will be able soon to better understand how the olfactory code works. So, which means basically we will be able to predict which uh, chemical substances will have what kind of smell. And that will be interesting because we will be able to create new smells, but it will be also interesting for, you know, very distant um, topics such as um, insect repellents. Uh, right now we, we use a handful of insect repellents because we have figured out that they they help, but we have no systematic approach to it. Of the of the million and mil billions of chemical substances, we don't know which one will be, uh, uh, that exist and that we could develop. We don't know which one will be uh, uh, active against uh, against the mosquitoes, for example. And I think with, with these new tools, we can analyze the olfactory space with much, much higher efficiency, and we'll be able to, to develop these kind of, of, of substances. And I think this is really, we will hear in the next years uh, a lot about these kind of, uh, of stuff. Wow, that is mind blowing. Wow. Fantastic. As we wrap up, Giannis, um, if you could share a bottle of wine, you said you are an aficionado of wine, with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would that be and uh, what would you ask them? Yeah, this is, this is a very, very uh, interesting uh, question. I, uh, 
you said it should be somebody from the wine world or from outside the oh, wine no. world. It could be anybody. Yeah, I would I would like to to have a, a glass of wine with Barack Obama, oh. and uh, I would I would like to take to to have a, a glass of wine with him. With wine from my home region in Alto Adige in in, in Italy, uh, and and uh, where there's a lot of white wine, but also quite tasty red wine, which I really appreciate. And I would like to have a chat with him, and I would ask him what went wrong. But uh, that that is what I would like <laughs> to have a wrong? discussion. Well, that's a big question. That that requires a whole bottle of wine, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we wrap up, uh, Giannis, is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to mention? Um. I think just one thing, it's not to say, not so much that we did not cover it, but I think uh, a take home message is that um, we have to talk more about smells. Smells, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to body odor, is a taboo. We can tell a, a colleague you have parsley in your teeth after, after lunch, but we cannot tell him you smell of garlic. Uh, mm -hmm. And everything mm -hmm. related to body odors is a taboo, but everything with smells we have a hard time talking about. And I think the one thing that will allow us to get better with our sense of smell is to share and share verbally to talk about smells. And this is something that can be very, very joyful. And, uh, and I think uh, wine tasting and wine drinking is one of those joyful moments where we can do it. And, and I think I'm not a specialist. And so maybe I, I say it for myself, but I think we are all the biggest specialists of the perceptions that we have. So if we smell, if we perceive something in a wine, Nobody can take that away from us. If we perceive vanilla, we perceive vanilla. And even if all the others say, I don't perceive vanilla, we are right. And I think this is, this is something that is quite, uh, that is quite positive about, about uh, the sensory perception in the context of wine, that we are all the biggest specialists of our own body and of our own smell. Absolutely. Trust yourself and uh, you don't always have to re rely on so-called experts. Wine experts, for sure. It is about your own experience and interpretation. Where can people best find you online and you and your work, Johannes? Oh, I, I may have me? lost you just for a oh. second. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Can, can you hear me still? You now, now you're you now back uh, on, I think. Yeah, you can hear me now. Can you I hear can me see now? you now. Now I can hear you. Yes, I can hear okay, you now. Okay, you can hear me. Oh, sounds like we're getting a bit of... Yeah, now I can hear sure. you. But intermittently. Oh, intermittently. Um, just one last question, if you can hear it. How can we find you online? Um, I, I mean, the, the, I have, I'm in a lucky position that I have a very unique combination of a first name and last name. So if you type that in, you will pretty fast uh, uh, find my, my, my lab and information about myself. Um, I am at the University of Quebec in Trois-Rivières, so if that's easier to type that into, into your Google, then you can go this way too. But if, uh, I would be very happy to, to receive any kind of feedback and uh, who knows what kind of discussions will come out of this conversation we just had. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's absolutely fascinating. Your research is, I mean, it's exciting for wine tasters and, and beyond. I, it's just... Wow, the things that are going to come out that are going to be benefiting so many people. So thank you for sharing that with us, Johannes. Thank you very much for having me. All right. I'll say cheers for now, but don't log off just yet. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.